4. The Growing Collapse of the World of Humanism A persistent problem in Christendom has been the unwillingness of people who profess to be Christ's congregation to make an unequivocal stand and approach Christ looking for fire and life insurance, not to submit to a sovereign. They come into the church for a variety of reasons, to find a wife or husband who can provide them with love or faithfulness, for business reasons, for a good training and environment for their children, and so on. One result is an impotent church. Historically, the nations have been equally dishonest and equivocal when they have had a semblance of Christianity. Acknowledging the triune God is fine with them, provided God does not interfere with their affairs. In fact, God should be supportive, if anything. After a resounding defeat, Louis XIV said, God seems to have forgotten all I have done for him. In political theories, God was made the great insurance agent and fulsome words paid honour to his place, as witness Jean Baudin. If we insist that absolute power means exemption from all law whatsoever, there is no prince in the world who can be regarded as sovereign, since all the princes of the earth are subject to the laws of God and of nature, and even to certain human laws common to all nations. Certainly, Baudin knew what sovereignty means, and that it can only properly be applied to God. Having stated the orthodox view of sovereignty and law, Baudin went on to say more. He presented the orthodox view in order to disarm critics. Beyond this, though, Baudin had his own particular, rather less orthodox view of the monarch and law. Whereas tradition had it that the monarch's definitive function is to administer justice, Baudin declared that the ruler's definitive function is to create law, if possible in accordance with natural laws, but in practice, of course, often enough not. The ruler, in this view, is essentially a lawmaker and the enforcer of the laws he makes, Baudin wrote. It is clear that the principal mark of sovereign majesty and absolute power is the right to impose laws generally on all subjects, regardless of their consent. And he declared that law is nothing else than the command of the sovereign in the exercise of his sovereign power. Law is, to a great extent, power, and power law. In practice, thus, sovereignty became a political attribute of rulers. Deism was one result. Deism is essentially a political rather than a philosophical doctrine. By positing, in its more consistent forms, an absentee god who created the world and then allowed it to go its way, the deists made legitimate the political exercise of god's attributes by civil rulers. The next step with Hegel and Darwin was to eliminate even the absentee God in favour of a non-theistic universe. Sovereignty does not disappear when we deny God. It accrues in man's thinking to the highest manifestation of power, the state. The concept of the divine right of kings followed the dethronement in Christendom of Christ's kingship over the nations. Authority was transferred from the Bible to the ruler, and the Bible's major function with some was to vindicate the ruler. This was clear in the thinking of James I of Great Britain. For James, the realm was under the king, not only in terms of a supposed ordination by God, but on other grounds as well. In a speech to the Lords and Commons of the Parliament at Whitehall, March the 21st, 1609, James said, The state of monarchy is the supremest thing upon earth. For kings are not only God's lieutenants upon earth and sit upon God's throne, 
but even by God himself they are called gods. There be three principal similitudes that illustrate the state of monarchy. One taken out of the word of God, and the two other out of the grounds of policy and philosophy. In the scriptures, kings are called gods, and so their power after a certain relation compared to the divine power. Kings are also compared to fathers of families, for a king is truly parens patriae, the politique father of his people. And lastly, kings are compared to the head of this microcosm of the body of man. These three grounds deserve careful attention. First, we have the argument from Scripture. James takes texts that refer to a ministry under God to claim sovereignty, something never condoned by Scripture. Second, James compares kings to fathers of families, an argument from the natural order. The family is God's basic institution according to God's law, and James, by placing himself at the head of all families, usurps the power of the family for the state. Third, the king is the head of this microcosm of the body of man. A nation is thus seen as an organic whole like the church, and the king is its head. Since the English church settlement under Henry VIII made the monarch the head of the church, James is now saying that the king is the head of both church and state. The role of the triune God is indeed that of an absentee landlord, and deism was soon to follow in the footsteps of such politics. James asserted thus a triple headship and sovereignty. Such was the position of James with respect to the people. With regard to law, James sent forth the priority of the king to law. In other words, the source of law is the king. In the true law of free monarchies, he wrote. The kings, therefore, in Scotland were before any estates or ranks of men within in the same, before any parliaments were holden or laws made, and by them was the land distributed, which at the first was wholly theirs, states erected and discerned, and forms of government devised and established. And so it follows of necessity that the kings were the authors and makers of the laws, and not the laws of the kings. The king is thus the source of law. As McElwain observes for James, the fundamental law is just regis, and nothing more. Thus, for James, the king is a kind of Christ, and both church and state are aspects of his mystical body. Kantorowicz observed, The good of the people is superior to that of the whole church. Here the head, so to speak, has devoured the whole mystical body. What mattered was not the corpus ecclesiae, but the caput ecclesiae, as though life itself or the continuity of life rested in the head alone and not in the head and members together. Such theology helped destroy the medieval church. The like theology is now destroying the state. Whether or not Louis XIV actually said, I am the state, or the state, it is I, this attitude summed up his attitude and that of other monarchs. In due time, dictatorships and democracies saw the entire people mystically incorporated in the state and its leaders. The Marxist doctrine of the dictatorship of the proletariat is a current version of this belief. The dictatorship incarnates the will of the people. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, of course, formulated this before Marx. For him, the general will of the people is embodied in the state and the will of the state. Robespierre, as Otto Scott has shown, applied this rigorously. He created the purge a medical term meaning the forced expulsion of feces. He gave it a new meaning that is with us still. The revolutionary banners carried the words liberty, equality, fraternity, 
or death? Since the head of the state, the voice of the general will is, according to Rousseau, infallible, the head of state is the voice of virtue. All dissenters are feces that must be purged. Rousseau was emphatic. The general will is always right and ever tends to the public advantage. Certainly in the Soviet Union all these humanistic doctrines come into fearful focus, but in every modern state they are strongly present. In political theory, in the name of the people, the modern state has swallowed up the people and reduced them to nothing. The state is now, in theory and often in practice, totalitarian. As a result, civilization is in crisis and decay. Material comforts are not lacking, but men's hearts feel them for fear. The state has devoured the people and their institutions. Controls are now extended over every area of life and thought. The family and the church, which should provide the leadership in society, are now under the state and its courts to be regulated and governed from without. Commerce and agriculture are state-controlled. Instead of the sovereign God of Scripture and His law word governing all other spheres of life, it is now the state which exercises this power. Modern man needs to echo Isaiah's words. O Lord our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 13. Other sovereigns have had dominion over us because we have chosen them and bowed down to them. But thine authority and lordship we alone acknowledge now. Spengler called the state the highest of all time symbols that have come into existence within the culture. This in itself tells us much. Such a perspective denies the validity of the most dramatic aspect of history, the incarnation, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the growth of his kingdom. When we relegate Christian history to the world of myths, then the state becomes the highest of all time symbols. Because of this, life is now defined not in terms of God and his word, but in terms of the state and its history. J. Paul Getty, in his day called the richest man in the world, sought immortality in two ways. First, he wanted it in politics as an ambassador, a goal he failed to attain. Second, he sought it in art or culture as a patron and the founder of a museum. Culture is modern man's substitute for the church. For Getty, it was a means of immortality, of being remembered by future generations. The state, as God walking on earth, must give meaning to life. Its political programs and planning begin by offering a safe and sure route to heaven and earth. In time, however, this illusion sets in. The state does not provide utopia but hell on earth as it accumulates power. The one area of consistent success on the part of the state is the accumulation of power. How then to realise its religious goal to provide meaning to life? The answer to this is to stress culture, art as the new realm of vision and truth. The state thus becomes a patron of the arts. In the Soviet Union, culture and the local opera house have replaced the Russian Orthodox Church in state planning. Culture, as Henry Van Til noted in The Calvinistic Concept of Culture, is religion externalised and made explicit. All over the world now, the state is increasingly involved in the promotion of the arts, in the furthering of a humanistic culture. To understand this culture, we must understand original sin. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 gives us its premise. Every man as his own God and law, determining good and evil for himself. 
This means the radical autonomy of man from God and man alike. Philosophy since Descartes and his I think, therefore I am, has built on this belief in man's autonomy. So too has much theology. Thus the transcendentalist Unitarian Theodore Parker held. The Orthodox place the Bible above the soul, we the soul above the Bible. Because Parker's autonomous man is more than mind and sometimes needs to depend on someone, there must be, Parker held, a God on whom man can depend as needed. Hence he held, I am, therefore God exists. Since Parker's day, the need to depend on God has been replaced by the need to depend on the state. The insistence on man's autonomy has been broadened to include the autonomy of all spheres of human activity and certainly art. What Anthony Cooney, in a publication which imagines itself to be conservative, has written on Ezra Pound's aesthetics is revelatory. What Pound proposed was that a work of art was autonomous. It did not exist for anything else but itself. In creating it, the artist was creating an objective universe with its own logic and its own syntax. A work of art does not exist either to entertain or to convey a message, social, political or moral. Art must therefore be of personal emotion. Further, because its function is neither to entertain nor to instruct the masses, there is no reason why it should be easily accessible. The public can go to hell, Pound declared. The artist is not required to dilute his creation for the sake of Philistines and morons. Because art is autonomous, it is irresponsible. The artist is not accountable to anyone but himself, if that. Strictly speaking, autonomy in art means that art is meaningless to all but possibly the artist. At best, an outsider can logically only admire the artist's success in rejecting and expressing contempt for all meaning. It is ironic that big business, one of the targets of the modern state and the modern artist, is a psychopathic and slavish customer of such meaningless art. Countless millions of dollars are spent by corporations in the purchase of such junk art. At one time, businessmen funded churches, monasteries, missions and Christian charities. Now they fund the arts of autonomous man, sodomite causes and the like. This doctrine of autonomy prevails in many places, whether in law, politics, education, the sciences or the church. It means that man is his own law and is subject to no law from God and eternity. The only permitted meaning is man-made or state-made meaning. One consequence of this is alienation, a communications gap, a pervading sense of aloneness in modern man. For him there is no God and because of his ostensible autonomy, no essential tie between himself and his quote-unquote fellow men. He is his own God and universe. A world without meaning and a life without meaning means that death also has no meaning and life becomes cheap as a result. Humanism, by its own success, creates a crisis and assures its death. Sigmund Freud saw his thinking as the culmination of humanism, but also its death. Humanistic man, having reduced God to a myth, now reduced himself to no more than his own unconscious impulses. The state as sovereign, replacing God, has made life empty and barren of meaning. The meaning provided by the state is not only subject to change as the heads of state change, but it is also negated by the evil, the corruption and the arbitrariness of the state's actions. Humanism as a faith soon found itself without any meaning other than the affirmation of man's autonomy, whatever that might lead to. 
Ralph Waldo Emerson was determined to replace the infallible providence of God with man's infallible providence. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 declares, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God's sovereign decree and providence bring good out of all things. Paul does not say that all things are good, but that God's providence makes them work together for good, brings good out of them. Emerson's attempt to replace this led to absurdity. He declared in a lecture in Britain that even in a brothel, man is on his way to all that is great and good. Emerson's faith in the value of man's self-expression was indeed a very great faith. Andrews Norton, himself a conservative Unitarian, saw the dangers in Emerson's thought very early. In A Discourse on the Latest Form of Infidelity, he saw the danger in abandoning supernatural for natural religion. He declared that, If there are no miracles, there is no religion. Many naturalistic religions exist, of course, and in that sense, Norton was wrong. However, Norton believed that, without supernaturalism, a religion would disintegrate and would carry man into disaster. In this sense, Norton was right. The states as God is a failure. It is a sovereign whose idiocies are daily ridiculed, even in the most oppressive dictatorship. Men have a particularly strong contempt for false gods. They do not last. The false gods are dying all around us. The sovereignty of the state is a dead end for man and the state. It gives us both law and life without meaning.